So, uh, I've talked before on this channel about the uh, ever-evolving nature of dog whistles uh, when it comes to the um, white supremacist movement. So when white supremacy in North America was mainstream in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, um, you could be a white supremacist in a protest movement, right? The KKK. And then later in the 70s and 80s, the skinheads, the neo-Nazis caught on in America, but they would openly identify as white supremacists. Then after the Timothy McVeigh bombing, um, somewhere in the late 90s, there was a rhetorical shift from white supremacist to white nationalist. So they transformed a um, an openly hostile uh, terroristic movement into a, a form of uh, political grievance. We want we want redress. We 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 don't hate. Um, non-whites, we just want a, a white nation for ourselves, and they make all these progressive-sounding claims about why a white nation is better for everybody, and there should be a black nation, and an a, a Indian nation, and a Chinese nation, and a Japanese nation. <coughs> Sorry, I'm a little beneath the weather. Um, and then, later on, during the Bush era, um, the end of the Bush administration into the beginning of the Obama administration, there was again a softening of terms, and the Tea Party just used uh, dog whistles about freedom and would specifically apply those to repealing specific amendments from the Constitution, like um, birthright citizenship, um, repealing... Um, the Civil Rights Act, but they would always say, oh no, it's under, you know, uh, freedom of, of uh, association. We should return segregation, uh, not because we hate black people and not because we think they're less than us, but because, uh, <clears throat> you know, the Constitution says, the Constitution says we have the right to discriminate. So then, after the Tea Party went down, um, the alt-right reared up its head. And the alt-right uh, returned to white nationalism um, when they thought they could win in electoral politics. Um, the alt-white... Uh, the alt-white... <laughs> the alt-right became attached to nationalism um, for two reasons. Number one, because they could form a coalition with quote-unquote civic nationalists and give the impression that they, they wanted the same thing as civic nationalists. So they would they would um, acquire a bunch of right-wingers that just, uh, you know, again, freedom and, and, and flag and apple pie. Um, but also, um, they were emboldened by Trump's victory and thought that um, he was the first domino in a uh, international uh, win for open white nationalists winning office, like uh, Marine Le Pen, that failed. Geert Wilders, uh, man, that fucking name is so hard to... Gert Wilders? Um, and a couple of other uh, European politicians who were running on a, a, a deeply xenophobic, highly nationalistic uh, platform. But once all those politicians lost, the dog, wish, the dog whistle evolved again into a uh, white identitarian. Uh, they named uh, one of their conferences Identitarian Ideas. And, and um, again, they were able to integrate people that would have been turned off by white supremacists, people that would have been turned off by white nationalists. Now, um, they have people like uh, Lauren Southern, who was on the fence when she was uh, at Rebel Media, now she feels like she can get away with murder because um, 
she just has to put identitarian and a couple of logos and that makes an adequate dog whistle to um, keep the revenue flowing from her audience that um, she's down with white identity and she's pro-white. Um, this is a this is an adaptation of uh, being pro-black. So that when people, it, it's, it, it's to me, it's an obfuscation. It's a means by which, um, when, when we have political discussion, um, people who, who who perceive themselves as centrist and, and liberal and moderate can go, oh well, I I I'm not pro-white. I'm not pro-black. Um, you know, not all identity politics are created equal. You know, um, my, I'm going to get to that in a second, but my, my concern was that earlier today, Philly, Philip DeFranco covered the incident with Lauren Southern at uh, the G20 in Hamburg, where she was harassed and some of the, her um, companions were assaulted by protesters because she was wearing an, a generation I, a generation identitaire um T-shirt, which is an organization that she's recently become um, very sympathetic to, and they are a they're a, a white identity, a European identity uh, movement in uh, Europe, and I believe that they they are classified by the Southern Southern Poverty Law Center as a hate group that has value to some people, and to other people, it'll make them um, you know dismiss the accusation. Usually people on the right dismiss the Southern Poverty Law Center because all their groups get called what they are, which is hate groups. Um, and the fact that, that when he was reporting on this story, he just said she was wearing an identitarian t-shirt and then moved on and finished the story, um, shows the extent to which the white identitarian rebranding has worked for um, the white nationalist movement. Because if he said white nationalist, um, it would have immediately evoked images of Nazi Germany, and he would have had to explicitly condemn her, and um, he probably would have even framed it that she was wearing the Nazi regalia, and that's what got her um, on the radar of um, the protesters. And I'm not justifying... Um, I know there was some pushing around, and I think some of her friends got beat up um, beating the shit out of Tim Pool is not going to um, do uh, do very much for our cause. Now, if those same protesters beat the shit out of some generation identitaire, like some real street team generation identitaire, then I would be more conflicted about the use of violence because you know when when you when you've got jackboots running around in the streets patrolling and um you know one uh, one gang so to speak encounters another um things are going to uh things are going to escalate but no i don't think i don't think that anything is accomplished by uh physically accosting um sympathetic journalists, even if they're sympathetic to a toxic and grotesque form of political philosophy. Um, so it slid by Philip DeFranco, and it seems to still be giving him one southern a pass in the skeptic community that she just kind of uses this very soft correlation to these, these um, white identitarian groups and European identity um, and these, these, these ideas, these ideas always kind of, uh, lead to the kind of activism she's been engaging in. I think she joined up, she joined up with their street team of uniform jackboot thugs. They were yellow with a weird, uh, Roman insignia on it, but it's just, it's, it's, it's another version of, uh, of, uh, the swastika, basically, that she engaged in. Um, attacking a ship of migrants who were coming into Europe, um, or, or I think she, it was vandalizing the ship. So, you know, look if you if you go out in the streets with a gang, 
in uniform. Um, whether it's it's being a you know if you're a journalist and you go to South Central and you want to document the gang war between the Bloods and the Crips, um, if you're going to spend a day with the Crips, uh, don't dress in their gang shit uh, because you, not that you're going to deserve anything that happens in terms of you know God forbid something happens to you as a journalist just because you're wearing blue that day. But um, you probably want to take every precaution. Like if you were in this situation between Antifa and Identitarians, and you know you lean whatever way you lean, uh, maybe don't sport their logos and shit when when you're outnumbered like two hundred to one. 